thanks so much. I'm very happy to be swimming with all of you. Uh, I love coming to PDF every year and getting inspired and learning from all of you in this room. So uh, it's very exciting to be here. Uh, I thought about King Off the Night study, uh, the night mind mapping uh, piece to start this. Uh, and there's some amazingly useful data there. But then I also thought I'm going to stick to what I know, which is, for the most part, the federal government uh, space. So the caveat here is uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, is still federal government with lots of applications to state and local. Uh, and then also that this is the beginning of the conversation. I do not <laughs> in any way uh, attempt to speak for all of you doing such wonderful work in this space. I've just tried to kind of find my way, as I've talked to others, to try to explain where do we sit in the, in, the, uh, in, in the environment of civic tech, and where do others sit, and how do we relate to this project, and how do we relate to that project, and how do we all fit together? And I think we're all working really hard to try to fit together. So we'll talk about that, but I'm going to start with the problem, just because I've lived in Silicon Valley too long, and we always start with the problem. Uh, so we know. There's a lot of money in politics. Right now, this is just the number for congressional races. It costs about $3 million on average to run a congressional race. That's not news. What I think is interesting to compare, though, is how much money goes in to helping Congress or any other elected official do their job once they get there. And it's actually a paltry amount when you look at it, especially when you think about the money that goes into electing people. The, the quants and the data that goes into knowing down to the neighborhood block to the actual house how you can get a person out to vote. We don't have those kinds of resources to figure out how you get that person's child to college. Uh, so I pulled together, this is probably not the best figure to look at, but I added together the congressional resource services that are there to help Congress make decisions. So Congressional Research Service, which is wonderful in the Library of Congress, the Government Accountability Office, the Congressional Budget Office, the Joint Tax Committee, uh, the Policy Committees in Congress, and still you don't get to a billion dollars. $3.3 trillion spent in the federal government, not a billion dollars there to, to help make decisions about it. This is the difference between electing and governing. There is, there's a vast disparity. Uh, in the amount of resources that are put towards electing and governing, and I would really like to see that change, and I think technology can play a role. And there's a big disparity between politics and civics, which I think was discussed uh, quite a bit yesterday. Uh, I have a little joke when people ask me, so you're a civic startup? What's the difference between a political startup and a civic startup? And I say, well, if there's money for it, it's probably political. <laughs> Yeah, they're right in front there. Uh, this, is, this is the difference between walking the walk and talking the talk. Uh, the big high piece is talking the talk. The smaller, the smaller number is, is walking the walk, and we need more resources for walking the walk. Imagine if you had a company that spent all of their resources in the sales and marketing side and very little on the product side. Mm. That might work if you had a really great product that was working awesomely and everybody wanted to buy it. But as we have heard, Congress isn't working that well. Uh, at least lately, uh, and, and people aren't raving about the product, and they haven't been for some time. Um, and uh, you know, you kind of wonder what happened around 2003 that made all this happen. Um, and I'm joking, really. <laughs> it's not our fault. <laughs> I am joking, but I do believe that, that the greater ability we've had to know what's going on in Congress, the greater the discontent. And that happens across the board. Um, and you know, the internet came along and things like that. Let's talk for a minute about the old system, uh, which kind of worked for what it did. Uh, you know, you, you'd have a policy that needed to be decided. The, the, the timing was running out, and everybody would go get in a back room, apparently smoke some cigars, name a few highways, send some money to an airport, come out and announce the deal, and you didn't know who had given what. Somebody had compromised, but they didn't have to do it in public. Uh, and, and that doesn't happen anymore. And I think most of us agree that that's a pretty good thing. I'm not going to say that, that earmarks are all gone, but for the most part, earmarks, backrooms, and things like that, they're not happening as often as they used to. Um, but there's not a lot else happening either. So we've got sequestrations. We've got shutdowns. We've got no deals happening. 
Uh, as you know, they used to call legislating sausage making. Uh, and we thought maybe if we start talking about what's in the sausage, we'll get better ingredients. But at least for right now, Congress has just stopped, stopped making sausage. So I say all of this to set up the fact that I think, oh, by the way, that's, that's not surprising. We have never had on this earth a transparent, participatory, inclusive, responsive democracy. That's not what they had in Athens. That's not what they had in Rome. That's not what we had 200 years ago. We had the best possible iteration of it. But technology is only now making possible real-time participatory responsive de democracy. And there's some bumps in the road. We're, we're in the 1.0 now. Uh, but I think that all of the work that we're doing in this space gets us ready for the 2.0, gets us ready for uh, how we start to build this new system. And the foundation of it is open data. The foundation of a, a, a responsible budget, of an informed public, of, uh, of decision, informed decision making by policymakers is open data. So this is where we get all charty. Uh, so we'll start talking about what happens inside government, what talks, t happens outside government, uh, but it all starts with the open data. And this is the stuff that is dry this is Carl, Mal Carl Malamud's uh, United We Scan. These are the laws, the codes, the maps, anything that can be scraped, uh, and better yet, if it's put out in a way that doesn't have to be scraped. Uh, but this is, this is what you need to know to even engage. If you don't know what the law is, how do you know you want to change it? And then the next step is the transparency. This is when you start to bring the people into it. This is what you do uh, with the structure. Uh, so this is everything from policies and procedures and budgets that get put out and the software that, that is used in the agencies and in, in the legislative bodies. And then you get closer to the political layer. Uh, and this is where government meets the people. Uh, and so this is everything from lawmaking and legislating to the rulemaking that happens in the executive agency, which in the US requires public comments to be taken into account requires to executive orders and even the mundane transactions and schedules. So you're going from most political to least political, from policy making to policy executing. And this next, next level I have put in the wrong place because it should sit right on that line between inside government and outside government. And this is one piece that we all need to do better, both inside government and outside government. And this is what Anthea was talking about, making things more understandable to individuals. This is what we're all working on, uh, trying to help open the door and involve people better and let them know what's going on. This is what the media used to do so well, and maybe with our new explainer media, uh, they're gonna dig in the weeds. This is what costs so darn much if you wanna get a subscription to Congressional Quarterly or BNA or Bloomberg Government or whatever it happens to be. It is really expensive to be informed truly about what's going on in Congress, and that's a travesty. Um, and then the next level is the civic engagement layer. And that runs from the most interested to the driest, most disinterested, you know, I'm just interacting with government. So on the most interested side are the regulated industries. You can bet they have a subscription to those publications I just discussed. When you're regulated, you have to pay attention. You pay people to help you pay attention. The next level is the lobbying, which again is, is most of the time professional, but paying attention, going in to interact with the legislation. Um, and on to the grassroots organizing. So I don't know how many people know that um, Grassroots organizing is actually called grassroots lobbying. It is a kind of lobbying. So you have direct lobbying, you know, company or organization or representative to the legislators. And then you have the grassroots lobbying, which is we're going to ask our members, our employees, our people, our friends, our supporters to go talk to their legislator. It's similar, but it's obviously a much wider um, interaction and effective. And then there's public opinion. So a lot of you know that Pawfox, sometimes when you go on there, you see very passionate people. And sometimes people say, but the polls say something completely different. Well, yeah, if you go out and ask a thousand neutral people what they think about something, and some of them haven't really thought about it very much at all, you get a very different opinion than when you see who's fired up, who's writing to Congress, who's agitating, who's, who's sharing their opinion. 
And Congress is used to hearing from the passionate people. Uh, so part of all, all of our jobs is getting public opinion to be more active opinion uh, and to express uh, that opinion, interest, and, and uh, advocacy within an effective sphere. And then you have expert advising, the academics and think tanks and others uh, who, uh, in a very good world, are a more neutral um, uh, interaction with policymakers, whether it's in the executive or the legislative branch. Next. Not advancing. So I think that open data can help good public servants do their job better, and I know that they want to. I hope everyone, if you, even if you weren't here this morning, gets to see Matthew Burton's talk from this morning, because there are really wonderful people working in government, and they would really like for you to make them do the right thing, to help them do the right thing, uh, it, including members of Congress. It's hard to take a hard vote if you don't have a bazillion constituents to point to and go to your leadership and say, you know, I'd love to be with you, but. Um, so here's just, just a tiny example of something that just recently happened. This was in the news. So Medicare provider data, yes, you can all go to sleep now, um, was just released. And you know, this is the first time that data about what Medicare pays for certain uh, procedures was made public. There's a pretty large disparity. They're like one procedure costs two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on one in one city and fifteen thousand dollars in another. That doesn't make any sense. And for someone working in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they would really like to change that and to enforce Medicare fraud provisions and things like that. But you know what would happen in the absence of data like this? They would get a letter from the member of Congress saying, I just heard from my doctor that, you know, in my district that they're getting cut and they're a wonderful doctor and things like that. In the absence of seeing where it falls in the continuum of uh, Medicare payments, it's hard for the member of Congress to understand, you know, where things are going. So th this kind of public data allows for public pressure that lets lawmakers do their job better, that lets the public interact in a more informed way and helps regulators make their case. Uh, so it moves up through this map that we've described, from the data to seeing how it's used, to understanding how it impacts policy, to allowing people to weigh in an informed way, uh, and even eventually for what I hope is coming in our 2.0 of this system, for tools for governing better. Uh, so very quickly, Popbox, we start with the bills, people weigh in, organizations weigh in, we send the messages into Congress. But something crazy happened a couple of years ago which is that the House Democrats started using our API to feed into their internal intranet. And I was like, whoa, like, we're scraping you guys, and now then we get data, and now you've got our API. It was like, wow, we've created this amazing circle where uh, we're helping you guys do your job better, too. I and mean, we were always sending the messages in, but the fact that we could have structured data that helped Congress, that's awesome. And this is not the first place. You have companies that put out mapping solutions and other things that begin to take public data that's been improved by civic input that then can be reconsumed by government and help to make better decisions. So I hope that that begins to fill in what I think is this enormous resource gap of people, money, technology, and everything that helps better decisions be made in the future. Uh, and that our 2.0 of legislating and regulating and doing so in a way that better consumes data and serves citizens can be enabled by technology and the work of the wonderful people in this room. Thank you.